Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are covering our fourth webinar for the semester. This one covering the Master of International Policy. And new this year, we are actually going to include a little bit about a DC program that we also have running now. And uh, we'll cover all of this and a little bit about the program itself and some of the support that we have. So be sure that while you're listening, that you are generating some questions for us and we have a chat box that is ready to go. Send those along and Ashley is going to monitor those and I'll try to look at that as well. And then if you do have some just questions you wanna ask at the end uh, vocally, then we'll unmute you and you can just ask those questions of us um, independently. So we'll get started. So today we're going to have joining us will be myself, uh, I'm Catherine Meyer. Uh, Director of Admissions Recruitment here at the Bush School. And then Matt Upton is our Assistant Dean and runs the Career Services and Student Services Office. So he will cover a couple of slides that deal with the support that we offer our students as well as a little bit about the Career Office. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information that's unique just to the MIP. It will be more inclusive to include the International Affairs Program, which the MIP is a little bit part of. So the agenda that I'm going to cover is a little bit about the degree options. Um, we'll focus a little bit on the College Station campus primarily, somewhat on the DC side and how it's beginning. The academic tracks and concentrations that you can choose from, a little bit about the curriculum overview and how that will run in the timeline. Then Matt will come in and do the student services and employment. I'll come back and do the application process and some of our recent stats for the International Affairs Department and then the costs and the benefits of this program. So got any questions, go ahead and shoot them out to us now. And then I'm gonna start with a little bit about the Bush School, just uh, one slide for this. But we are a graduate school only here at Texas A&M University. We did open in 1997. We have now over 2000 alumni who graduated from the Bush School. We are now offering four on-campus degrees. That's the Master of Public Service, Master of International Affairs, Master of International Affairs, Public Health, three-year um, program, and then the Master of International Policy, which I'm covering today. Additionally, I am gonna cover the DC campus area on a slide. And then we also offer four graduate certificates and an online degree in the Executive Master of Public Service. So we are preparing students for careers in a number of different public service fields. Primarily, you're gonna see federal government, state local government, nonprofits, government contracting, private industry is the largest sectors that our students do go into. You're not gonna see a lot that go into PhD programs. There's better programs out there that have a thesis base um, that prepare students for that type of research career or teaching. Um, but a few of our students do find that niche and we'll go on to that. But most will find this as a terminal degree. They're coming in for the two years to do this program and then going out into the workforce. So let's start with this executive level Master of International Policy. So this is a one year degree. It's 30 credit hours. Um, it can be slowed down if someone needs to do more than just the one year. Um, just want to point that out but it does require six years of professional international experience. And we say that's broadly defined because it can encompass a number of different aspects of a person's career, including military service, including some of the living abroad, um, working in jobs that might've been business related, maybe even working here in the US, but having an outside interest of volunteering for organizations that may be religious based that go overseas and do some work through an agency. So we leave that up to the department head, uh, Dr. Gauze, to declare if someone has and reaches that six years of experience in order to apply, um, but he's pretty strict with that. So it's not just, I've been out for six years, there's really nothing international in it. In that case, you would not qualify for this degree. We do run a year round cycle for admissions for this degree in particular. Um, typically, our largest enrollment is typically in the fall. Uh, we do have a couple that come in in the spring. Sometimes we'll have one or two in the summer, um, but that is just dependent upon a, a, a applicant's needs and, and what they want to do with it. Um, many of our students are military-based, um, 
but again, it doesn't have to be. There are no internship requirements for this degree because we are expecting people to come in with experience already. The capstone project where you're working for a client is also not required for you. There is no foreign language that is required like it is in our international affairs degree. It's great if you do have one, we have resources to help you upkeep that, but not required for graduation. But you also do not get our Bush School scholarships. And so just wanna make clear that there are opportunities to get financial aid if you're applying for FAFSA, getting loans, maybe some grants that are out there. Um, military benefits will work, but by and large, you're not gonna receive our help independently for that. The degree plan that you're going to be using is very simplistic of, basically it's usually four courses, four courses, and then two. Um, but you're using the tracks and electives that we have available through our international affairs program to pick and choose what you want to build um, the aspect that you're trying to fulfill. So whether it's national security, whether it's intelligence, I want more diplomacy, I want to focus on development issues, you can choose what's of interest to you based on your um, degree plan and building with your advisor. It also offers a lot of flexibility in that you can take up to six hours of elective courses online if you so chose so that someone maybe only has to be here for the two semesters and can then do their final classes away from here. Um, if you do that, just realize that there's an additional cost because they're online classes and they cost about $1,500 per if you do that option. So the executive level degree, that Master of International Policy that we're beginning in DC, it's brand new. Um, we just opened the doors for that. We are trying to hire staff and faculty for that location right now. And I have their contact information at the end of the slides, um, but there's no phone number yet even established that I'm aware of. So we're just gonna start with a little bit of overview and I've got Jackie's information at the end to share, but it's supposed to start for spring of 2021. They're looking for a class, even anticipating somewhere between six to, to 12. <clears throat> if we can get more than that, great, but we're gonna start small, grow it as we go along. It's the same one year, 30 credit hour degree, six years required of international professional experience, still does not have an internship, capstone, foreign language, uh, or GRE, which the other one didn't either. Um, applications are going to be accepted for spring, summer, and fall, just like the MIP here in College Station. But this one is designed for working mid-career professionals and offering evening courses, which is different than what we do here in College Station. So we are looking for students who are working in the DC area with the different organizations and agencies who are wanting to continue on, get their master's degree, and do that on a part-time basis. <clears throat> we will start, excuse me, <clears throat> with a national security and diplomacy track. We expect about a dozen courses to be available that you can choose from. And then we'll build out additional options as we grow both the faculty and the students. Up to six hours, same thing, are also being able to be uh, chosen to be online um, for elective courses if you so choose. Keep going the wrong way. So the DC location just uh, created this one last night to talk a little bit about what it looks like. So this is designed for the working mid-career professional. It is in a teaching site that we acquired over the summer that is blocked from the White House. It does have ground floor access. So we will be advertising as well with other Texas A&M entities. It's supposed to be a um, kind of an Aggie intellectual location for us. Um, this location is convenient to the Metro lines for the red, the blue, the orange, and the silver. Um, so it is going to be great access for people getting to and from work. Um, they are hiring their own staff and faculty. But we're also hoping eventually that some of our faculty and students might be able to do some time there at that location amongst their studies. It hasn't been announced kind of what that looks like yet, so I can't talk about it because I'm not even aware. Um, but initially, we're going to start with a focus in international policy, international security, and intelligence. And I've got a little bit more on that on the slide. But um, there is going to be a new 42 credit hour degree that's in the works for spring of 2022 that will be in addition to the current MIP. 
But again, more on that as it gets approvals and flushes out. Um, but remember that as a DC location, these students will also have access to the Texas A&M resources. So you're getting full advantage of the Aggie Network, which has over 500,000 alumni. You've got students all over the world. And it is going to be a center that is going to have speakers and seminars and conferences and hopefully those exchanges. So it'll be a robust area and we'll just see more options grow through this. And we're excited about that opportunity. So to talk about the academic study, it, specifically this is the one in College Station, which is more robust right now because this partners with our International Affairs Program. Um, if a student does come into the MIP here, you've got a choice in tracks, international development and economic policy or national security and diplomacy. And then whether or not you want to create a concentration is up to you. It's how you put those classes together. But any of those options that are listed here are available. The ones in red are tied to the national security and diplomacy track. The ones in brown can work with both areas. And the ones in that aqua are more related to the international development. But you're not tied to having to do any particular type of concentration. So even if you're a national security and diplomacy person, you can take any of those concentrations. And remember that our regional studies here um, are focused on Middle East, China, and uh, Europe. So we have that here in College Station. If you go to the uh, option in DC, then you're focused only on national security and diplomacy, because that's what they're gonna start with. And then they've limited the areas of study to American diplomacy and foreign policy, intelligence, international politics, US defense, and their regional studies are similar, but Russia, former Soviet Union, East Asia, and the Middle East. So that will become a little more robust in time, but for now, that is what will be available starting this spring and summer. So the MIP curriculum, keep in mind, this is only 30 hours, so it's 10 courses. Your semesters one and two is a matter of putting together two required courses which is at INTA 606 and 608. And then you've got five track classes based off that national security and diplomacy or international development. And then three more electives. And that's based off all the courses that we offer at each of these two locations. Now, if you're here in Bryan College Station, then your semesters one and two might be a fall start in a spring. And you're taking four courses in the fall, four in the spring. And if so chosen, there's two classes that we typically offer um, here in residence that you could do. In that case, it's terrorism in today's world and deterrence and coercion um, that you could do and then graduate in August and you're on your way. So if you're doing those courses online, then you have a whole litany of, of choices of what's available and you can do those from anywhere to finish up your degree but it, it does typically take one full year to do it. Now, again, if you're taking courses online, just remember there's a little bit of an additional cost for that. And then Matt, I am passing it on to you to talk a little bit about student enhancement, um, some of the programs that we offer here in support of our students on the Bryan College Station campus. Great, thanks, Catherine. Um, so I was, uh, I've kind of been running from one thing to the next today, so I apologize about that. Um, so as Catherine said, you know, we have some resources that we have in place here in Bryan College Station, and we are working closely with the Washington DC staff to determine what that might look like in the future. Um, and so a lot of that will be driven by the needs of our students there. We recognize that in the DC campus, um, that students will likely continue working during that time and will not be taking the time off to go to school full time. So we'll play with that um, as the as the DC campus and DC site gets up and running. But here locally, we have a leadership development program. Um, Holly Casper Bauer runs that program for us. And really that's um, functioning to help uh, help you know more about yourself. So we start off by having all of our students complete the strengths quest or strengths finder assessment and then also Myers-Briggs type indicator assessment. Many of us have done that previously in our careers, but we do it again as a foundation for knowing more about ourselves. And then we use that as we assist students as they move through group activities and group projects through their classes and then also just interfacing with others. 
um, all in preparation for their um, their future career in the field of public administration, public service, uh, international affairs. So that's what the leadership program is focused on in a nutshell. Um, we do have a, a writing program. Right now that writing program is down a staff member, so we're a little more limited on what we can offer. It is not an editing resource, um, although the university, Texas A&M University, has a writing center out of the library. Um, and they do offer some additional assistance with editing and things like that. They're not going to read all your papers <laughs> and edit them for you, but they can provide some resources uh, on those types of things. Um, we do have a staff member who has resources and offers a zero credit writing course that a number of our students participate in. It functions just like a class. The great thing about it is you don't pay tuition and fees for it, but it also helps you focus on enhancing your writing so that you can be a more effective communicator um, in, your, in your briefs, um, in your memos, um, in any of your technical writing or things related to policy analysis and those types of things. So it is a good opportunity to do that. And then we do have language resources for our international affairs students. Now, the international policy degree does not have a language, a foreign language requirement for the degree like our international affairs program does, but you would still, you will still have access to participate in a couple of resources. One, we have online Rosetta Stone resources so that you can use those as are offered to you as an international affairs student. Um, and then we typically, during non-COVID times, have um, opportunities for you to participate in group language groups. Um, those are led by a native speaker or a fluent speaker. So obviously, uh, depending on what kinds of resources we have available here with students, speak, people who are speakers, um, native speakers or fluent in those areas, gives you a chance to practice that. Um, so it does give you a chance to enhance your language skills while you're here. Um, in addition to that, we have a number of speakers, a uh, number of conferences that are uh, held throughout the year. Even this year, those things are ongoing, obviously shifting to a virtual format. But there are plenty of opportunities for you to participate in that. Uh, we've had people, uh, there's a pandemic conference that goes on every couple of years, typically alternates between here and Washington, D.C. Um, the speakers that come in are coming from all over the world. Um, no lack of opportunities because you're in Bryan College Station. There are some study abroad trips available to you that you can participate in. Those typically take place over the winter break. Um, and then they typically have one again right after the spring semester is over. So typically mid-May uh, for a couple of weeks, there is academic credit associated with that. So it would count for an elective for you. We do have some reciprocal exchange programs in five different countries. Um, I can't remember them all. Uh, I know Canada, China, um, Germany. Uh, those are the three that come to mind immediately. Uh, but there are opportunities for that. That would be something you would have to work on a little more restricted in the MIP program because of the length of time that you're here um, is so shortened. Um, and then our research institutes, centers, and programs are opportunities for you to get involved in specific areas, whether that's international affairs with the Scowcroft Institute, trade economics and public policy for the Mossbacher Institute, grand strategy, women, peace and security, intelligence studies, um, Middle East program. And then also we have an Institute for Science, Technology and Public Policy um, and nonprofits, although obviously our international policy students are gonna be less interested in that. So career um, statistics. Now these are from our international affairs program because keep in mind that most of the people who are coming into our international policy program are coming to us from full-time employment and are going back into that full-time employment. So employment statistics, um, as we continue to have international policy graduates, this may change, but this gives you a snapshot of those who are coming in from our international affairs program. Most of these individuals have less than one year of professional work experience. So the numbers will look a lot different for those of you that are coming in with previous experience. But you can see that federal um, employment sector and the government contractors, which are typically federal employers, are anywhere between 50 and 60 percent um, typically each year. Our employment rates are typically between 81 and 95 percent employed within six months of graduation. We report that across the board with other APSIA schools. So if you're looking at Georgetown or George Washington or American or any of the other programs that are a part of APSIA. They also report at six months post-graduation. 
Um, some of them may report at 12 months post-graduation, so just pay attention so you know you're comparing um, an equal opportunity, but you'll see that our students have no problems getting into the career fields that they're interested in. This is a list of the agencies. You'll see all of the typical intelligence agencies, CIA, um, Defense Intelligence, U.S. Uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, Government Accountability Office. You'll also see those law enforcement places, uh, FBI, DEA. So no shortage of opportunities for our students there. Government contractors, the same way. Just a quick list of where people are going. You'll recognize those if you've been in the field for a while. Booz Allen Hamilton, International Development, Commonics, those types of things. I'm in the private sector. We, are, we do have students that are graduating and going to work for places like Microsoft um, or places like KPMG, Ernst & Young, consulting firms like Deloitte and others. Typically with Ernst & Young, they've been in transfer pricing careers with Microsoft um, and with British Petroleum or BP. We've had people go into business intelligence fields um, because obviously those are things that are important in the fields of international affairs. They're doing international business and need to be secure in what they do. Um, if you decide you don't want to go into the federal government, there are opportunities that our graduates have gone into in state and local government. We're obviously seeing uh, states and, uh, and local governments pay more and more attention to cybersecurity. Um, if they are, if they are a place like the city of Houston, the port of Houston obviously has security issues that they're concerned about. So those are places that our graduates have gone to work. Um, and then nonprofit organizations, think tanks like the Brookings Institution, um, other organizations uh, that you can see listed there. So I think you're back to me now. <laughs> I think so. That's what it looks like. I will say that if anyone has questions that they want to ask Matt, now's a good time because he's not going to stay on the rest of it. I'm open to sending some chat questions. If you've got a question and I'll come back to you and you can just unmute and do it. Um, I'm gonna wait for a couple seconds just to see if anybody's got it. But thank you, Matt. Otherwise, if nothing comes up, appreciate your time. Absolutely, and don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can find my contact information on the website or Catherine can, or Ashley can put you directly in touch with me. If you want to speak to any of our graduates, um, or if you won't have questions about the degree program, I'm happy to put you in touch with them and help you connect. Okay, well, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, so we're going to move on to the MIP application requirements and what that looks like depending on your time frame. But we do have a fall deadline that is coming up. That'll be April 15th. The spring deadline is on October 15th, which is just now coming up. And the summer deadline is on March 15th. We don't expect as many to come in on the summer as we do in the fall. Um, and spring just fluctuates. But the required pieces, now this is gonna be a little bit different. I only put the Unicast app up because it's the new one that we are transitioning to for uh, this next year. But if anyone is applying for the spring, they will have to do the old Apply Texas. It is very clearly distinguished on our website under the MIP application section of which one you need to fill out. Um, but for either purpose, you have to fulfill an application and pay the fee. And then there's a statement that is due with it, as well as an international experience essay, which is just trying to capture specifically the kinds of international experience you're bringing in whether that's dealing with travel, uh, language ability, um, coursework that you took that was international related, living abroad, um, cultural exchanges, anything that you think encompass that aspect of international experience, you would include it there. The GRE is encouraged if that GPA is below a 3.0, but it is optional. So that depends on you and your background and comfort with taking that test. Uh, we do also require a professional resume. Just usually ask that it be cut down if it's a military one. Just cut it down to two pages, primarily. Um, transcripts will need unofficial the time that you apply, but official by the time that you enroll with us. And then we need two letters of recommendations. So this is similar to what the MIA asks for um, with a, a few modifications, like fewer letters of rec. Um, if you are coming from a country where English is not your native language, um, then you would have to do an English proficiency test, um, either of scores or meeting in some other way. 
Now the application steps and timelines, we are roll, a rolling admission. So as those come through and you work with Ashley in applying, which she's available at our Bush School Applications at tamu.edu email address, she's going to work with you one-on-one -on, -one on getting that application complete and in front of the faculty as quickly as we can, and then getting an admission decision back to you. It is not the step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step interviews and all of that that we do for the MIA. This one's a rolling admissions a couple at a time. Um, like I said, we only enroll a few in the program. So right now we're looking at probably again between eight to a dozen to 15 in the fall and probably less than half that is going to be in the spring and then a handful in the summer if possible. So the admissions information is online on our website. Just go to the Bush School website, go to the admissions, and then there's a pull down with the degree section and then click your department, which would be international affairs. So the international affairs by the numbers, it's hard to separate out with MIP. We had eight come in this fall and spring, I mean, including the spring as well. Um, and the average GPA was a 3.16. The average GRE, I did not include because only a couple of people supplied it. So we excuse it one way or the other. And actually it skewed it a little high <laughs> at times, so I don't want to intimidate people. Average age, as you can see, is completely opposite of the MIA. So while the MIA comes in fairly young, between 23 to 25, this MIP average age was 32. Women make up 38% of that class that came in. Minority percentage was 25%. International students is 13%. That's probably one student out of this. And then the non-residents makes up over half typically of the enrollment because students are coming from all over the nation to do it. And then years of work experience, it requires six, so you're automatically in the five plus years. So it was 100% of the MIP, which is again, a, a lot different look than what our MIA, which takes students from the time that they graduate onward. So a lot of the students, because the area that we live in, Bryan College Station, is not a major metropolitan area, so it's harder to pull that mid-level career. And so we do typically get students from zero to three years um, coming into the program. So that's why we like the MIP to, to interact with that and, and, and add some experience to the classroom. You're learning from professors, both with seasoned practitioners who had a, a lifelong career in the State Department or in intelligence agencies or one of the private sectors. Um, and they're coming back as well as researchers. They've top of their um, research areas in Middle Eastern studies, um, all kinds of areas through this. Um, you can see just from the institutes and centers that we have here, they're leading those areas and bringing speakers in and leading conferences on some of these um, concentration areas that we're experts in. Um, so definitely consider that you're going to get top-notch professionals, both here and in the DC area, depending on where you decide to enroll. And the average class size here, at least on the College Station campus, is about 16 students. Um, a lot of the classes are very interactive and they limit enrollment. And so in that case, there's no more than 20 in some of those classes, 16 in some of the others. Um, so, okay, I just noticed I have a chat question. So it says, who can I speak with about the best degree plan where a student can collaborate, collaboratively pursue a certificate in Homeland Security. Um, would the MIP be the best route? Okay, so I don't know, and Ashley, you might be able to, to say some stuff on this too, but I don't know that anyone who's in, my, in, in our MIP is actively pursuing maybe the Homeland Security certificate with it. Um, I think it's possible just by how you put together your classes uh, with your concentration, but that's going to be a, a coordinating probably with the department, the MIA, INTA department, um, along with the advisors and certificate. Is that what you would suggest, Ashley? I would just keep in mind that the certificate, most of their courses, most of the certificate students do take their courses online and the Masters of International Policy only allows up to two courses to be taken online. So if you do, let's say the certificate in Homeland Security and you do all five courses online, only two of those would be able to count towards the international policy degree. So that's the caveat to keep in mind. 
we've had one student who's completed the certificate and is interested in coming to the Masters of International Policy, but I don't know that we have any anyone who has completed the MIP yet. Okay. Yeah, and that's my thinking on that. So you can start with Ashley and myself to get that ball rolling, and then we're really good about partitioning that out to the right people to get answers and to make sure that you're um, not applying to a program that doesn't work for that. So just reach out to us if you want to, to get it started. Um, all right, moving on to the MIP costs and benefits, just to talk about the cost, the one year cost here in Bryan College Station is calculated at about 16,500. And that's for Texas residents, if you reside and have a residency declared, right? We don't issue the non-tuition um, waivers for those that are coming in from out of state like we do with the MIA, because those are all centered around scholarships. So if you do come to us from out of state, your price tag is gonna be higher for this MIP. It's gonna be about 32,000 for students for the non-residents. And this does not include the living costs. This is just purely the um, tuition and fee portion. Is that right? No, that doesn't sound right. No, yeah, you're right, it is. It is, because that puts in another 20,000 on it, uh, roughly. And then cost in DC, I don't know a lot more than what's posted here. If anything has changed, we haven't been privy to it, but they were expecting courses to cost around $1,300 per credit hour. And since all classes for this degree are three hours, it's $3,900 per class. So it's roughly 39,000 to complete the degree in full. That's 30 hours. So just as a discrepancy between the two, just notice there's a little bit of difference with that. But you will be able to reach out to the office in DC and double check the price um, and, and what they're expecting closer to the time that things get rolling over there. Um, so again, I've got Jackie's information at the end of this slides. But the affordability is that you are saving on a one year cost. You don't have to live in either area for two years. Um, to complete this. So you can apply for outside scholarships. You can use your military benefits. Sometimes in those jobs, you can ask for financial support if they're willing to pay to have you come in for one year and back out. I don't know that any of our students have done that yet, but I know that is an option, especially in the DC area. Um, and you can submit FAFSA and find out about loans and grants. So don't forget those other options um, to help yourself out with that. So I just put a recap here in case any of this also jogs your memories of something else that you wanna ask a question for. Um, at this point, this is the end of my slideshow here. I'm gonna put the next slide up in just a second, but if you've got any questions about faculty, about concentrations and specialties, um, the collaborative environment that we have, um, the consulting project isn't relevant for the MIP, um, nor is the internship, but you are getting the value of a Texas A&M University behind your name, along with the being a, a top 10 best value because A&M is ranked um, for having that um, influence of, of a degree along with getting some payback for your salaries. We do have speaker events and conferences. The faculty are working with you just as much as the career services office on getting advising and getting to the right place. The networking here is incredible uh, and very, very personable uh, staff and faculty here to help you. And then those excellent employment rates that Matt talked about earlier, um, not as relevant necessarily with the MIP because many times you do go back to your sector, but um, something to think about as well. And then it's just affordable, um, something to get you to those next steps. So I did put the DC, DC location in their email address. I didn't have a phone number provided yet, but Jackie Lindy is the person running that area. She is answering that Bushville DC at tamu.edu email address. And then if you've got questions just in general or not sure where to start, just send those over to Ashley and myself. We're at Bushville Admissions at tamu.edu. And our phone number is there with 979-862-3476. And we're here most days. We're not working remotely. We are in our offices. We have our masks when we walk out of the office, but we're here to support you throughout the semester and can work with answering questions and getting you connected to the right people. I had originally planned on trying to have a, a current student here with us for this, but it, I think it's easier just to have that as an option that if you 
want to be put in touch with a current student, we can try to do that outreach through an email. So just send us one of those later. So at this time, I want to just ask if there's any questions that you want to unmute yourself or if you want to send something to us through chat. I'm going to see if there's anything that comes through in the next few minutes. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to put up a plug while you're thinking about your questions and just remind you that there are additional webinars coming up. You may have already signed up for some of these, but if you haven't, they're live and, and ready to take it. I will show that there's one change that I did have in that career services uh, was originally on October 28th. And I had to switch the date with co-curricular. Um, so those flipped, I've alerted everyone about that. Um, but the financial aid won't help MIP much um, in that aspect. But if someone is listening here and also trying to do the MIA, then that'll give you some helpful websites and information about how financial aid works at the grad level. Um, and then we also had a really fun event yesterday where we opened up a, a Zoom Q&A hour. And Ashley and I were on there with Dylan, one of our current students, and we had about seven or eight students come through and ask some questions about their application or some follow up. And we were just having a good time answering those questions and some stayed online and listened to what the other questions were about and the answers and then came up with another one. Um, so we were busy the whole hour and it was a lot of fun. So if you have some Zoom Q&A sessions you'd like to attend and listen to some other people, um, hear what they have to say. We'll have another one October the 7th with a student and then October 22nd. And we'll just keep going with these throughout until the applications are due in December. And then we'll probably have one or two more in, in January, just in case. We'll see how popular they still are at that point. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. So I'm going to just take this time to wrap up and thank you guys for your time. And just remember, join us on these others and feel free to reach out to us at that Bushville Admissions uh, email address because we're here to help you out whenever you're ready. So thank you guys. I appreciate it.